of the ancient Aramaic language and how it has clues in it to help us become more awake and aware and um, to guide us in how we're living this life. So we have, I've been teaching plasma technology for since about 2015 around the planet. And I've been to South Africa, I've been to all done tours all around the United States, Mexico, Costa Rica. So we have a lot of really cool new technology we're going to be sharing. We're going to be on every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from noon to two, and this is going to be our slot. And then Saturdays, we're going to try Saturdays from 6 to 8 p.m., and the times are Eastern straight across the board. So 6 to 8 p.m. on Saturday to kind of have an evening time. We're going to be teaching how to make things like Ormus. What is Ormus? You know, well, you get to find out. Like that's part of the journey that we're on. What is plasma? What is plasma technology? Plasma tools are things that can help make us more healthy. They can help reduce our electric bill. Some really cool, cool, cool things that I've gotten to be part of with a whole big worldwide community. And we, uh, so we're gonna be teaching you how to do those things. So that's what some of our shows are gonna be. We'll also be making some healthy recipes. We'll go into the kitchen and we'll be making things like seed milk and veggie burgers. Um, basically along kind of the more vegetarian healthy lifestyle idea, but, and we can answer your questions um, as far as what foods are going to make you more healthy. You can pop a question in there and I'll answer it for you. Um, how can you change your life and make your life work better for you? Because we want to see you vital, alive, healthy, excited, and um, living your truth, living your living your consciousness. Hey, Michelle. Hello. Hi. Good to see you today. So Michelle is my guest and she is a really beautiful friend that I've known for, gosh, how long have we known each other? Since about 2012, 2013-ish, somewhere probably um, oh, yeah, about exactly. seven years or so. Cool. No, um, forgiveness work brought us together. That's right. And you have a lot to do with forgiveness work. You're a, um, you're a forgiveness work champion. Tell me what, so Michelle, first of all, you're a therapist, right? Yeah, I, um, I private practice. I'm a limited licensed psychologist. I'm a certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor, and I have my own private practice in Michigan. That is really cool. Really, really cool. And so what is forgiveness work all about? Well, um, I think that um, I was trained as a, a therapist um, in a traditional APA kind of way. However, um, when I began to become familiar with the tools and the principles related to forgiveness work, I realized that it transcended anything I had previously known as it related how to support people or um, have them take responsibility for their, their symptoms, their, their fears, their hostilities, their sadnesses, their griefs, their guilt, their shames. And in, in a way that was so effective and so much more powerful than the previous tools that I had um, been taught, I, a, a, adapted the um, conversation to, you know, support my clients and in, in teaching them these principles in our uh, clinical sessions. And so I found the work when I first um, came upon it, like you said, in 2013, so transformative that I, I recognized immediately that I needed to take this message um, to my, my caseload and, and made the commitment that I was going to help support healing the planet, like one client at a time, because the, the work is so powerful. And then people get such amazing results. They feel moved, touched, inspired just to, to share it with their, their friends and their family and, and the people they know. And so it kind of ex exponentially expands because, you know, this person tells two these people and these two people tell those four people and on and on you go. 
Right. Well, let's talk about what that is, because what's really cool, and I think the wave that's happened in our whole self-awareness, say in the last 50 years, really, and it sort of started with S. Warner Earhart and then Tony Robbins and all these different big thought leaders in the personal change world basically brought out that it's really up to us that we want to blame everybody else out there for our problems or our issues or our suffering, but it's really up to us. And that is a whole change in how we, how we live our lives. And that's what we're, kind of what we're talking about. My book number two, which is called Mind, 21st Century Superhuman um, Mind, and is about, it's really about this forgiveness work. And it's kind of a whole um, journey. And we use the saying, breathe, smile, and love because that changes our neurobiology and it really comes from this ancient Aramaic forgiveness work. Um, you and I both have a good friend named Dr. Michael Rice and he's, his work has been the foundation of a lot of our learning in this particular field, which I'm really grateful for. And I mentioned him in my book, he wrote a foreword to the book. And um, so we have these different elements that are literally built into us. And what was Aramaic? Aramaic was the language that Yeshua or Jesus spoke or taught in, and actually Buddha taught in it and Zoroaster before him. So this is a really ancient language and I call it a language of quantum physics. It's a language of the physics of our existence instead of just wordiology. So the Aramaic tells us about these elements inside of our inside of ourselves, inside of our neurobiology that we can reset. We're literally like a biocomputer. And a lot of what we're doing here, our DNA reads us like a biocomputer. It transmits information to us and from us. So can you share a little bit, Michelle, about what those different elements are? Rachma, Kuba. Um, <laughs> so Rachma is really in the frontal lobe of our brain, right? Exactly. And, and that is um, a filter over our perceptions. And the concept being that in any given moment, you're using all your senses to develop what you call your reality, your personal story. And if you have a filter of fear over your perception, then you're going to see that story as threatening. And if you have a filter of hostility over your perception, you're going to see that that reality as irritating. The only way to have a productive and constructive and accurate um, perception is to have a filter of love over our perceptions. You only use a very small bit of information to generate what, what you and I call our reality. Yes. And for, for most people, it's a far, um, it's, a, it's a far distance from the actuality of what's really going on because people are not consciously um, recognizing that they're bringing their, their past and they're, and they're using it as an overlay for what they're currently experiencing here and now. And that's where you get people with repetitive cycles. You mentioned Dr. Rice, um, his book, Why Is This Happening to Me Again is an apt title because people go into these circuitous patterns year after year after year and they bring their past into their current moment and then they destroy it. Yes, that's that's really true. We tend to live these repeated patterns. It's like the layers of the onion. And we're literally carrying in our physiology a resonance, the, a vibrational resonance of our old data. And our old data can be caught in our cells, in our physical, in our physical body. And this resonance is what keeps, it's kind of like an old tape playing over and over. And what we want to do is clear those old tapes. So that's really what the forgiveness work is all about, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. It, it's being able to heal those wounds so that you can experience your here and now as fully as possible. And not contaminate it with, you know, most of the stuff we've consciously forgotten, but it's certainly stored in, um, in our bodies, in our physiology, 
in our in our unconscious memories. So let's just say I let me just go back a second because I kind of um, wanted to just um, ground these in our conversation. But Rachma is in the frontal lobe of our brain, and it is really pure love and it's activated when we smile so rachma smiling when we smile at somebody else we're saying i send you love and the ancient polynesians and then the ancient polynesians actually had a greeting where they would put their foreheads together it's the old hawaiian and polynesian greeting and then in the back of the brain is a filter that is activated Kuba? by our breath, Kuba. So we have Rachma in Aramaic and Kuba. And Kuba is activated by the breath. So when we take a breath, we're literally acting neurobiology in the back of our brain with Kuba. And then we smile along with it. And so R Kuba says, I greet you with perceptions of love. And Rachma says, I greet you with intentions of love. So breathing, when I breathe, when I meet you, and this ancient Greek, uh, customary greeting where we put our foreheads together and we breathe the same breath and say, I'm greeting you with open perceptions, with perceptions of love. I'm opening my neurobiology as I greet you. And then we're smiling and we're saying, and intentions of love, my intentions for you are of love and literally we can walk into the post office the grocery store and just by breathing and smiling we literally change the vibration of that reality and like we were talking the other day you know the line goes forward suddenly we're in front of the teller who helps us suddenly our needs are being met because we're literally putting out this loving vibration and if our only mantra is breathe and smile, we literally are starting to remove these layers of the onion that you're talking about, those old tapes that want to play in every situation. So say I walk in somewhere and I go, oh man, okay, there's a long line. I'm at the end of the line. Am I activating anything? Is that an old pattern? Probably. And am I activating anything that's going to change it? Or if I take a breath, and I smile and I go, wow, looks like this line is moving pretty good. You know, right. Um, how do we, you, you know, go ahead. Yeah. I want to hear what you think. Well, um, well you met asked earlier, um, Werner Earhart, I became involved with the modern version of us, which kind of evolved into um, a body of work called landmark education it's it's currently a global um company with you know um centers all over major cities all over the world and one of the biggest principles that they um, promote is the idea of possibility meaning in any given moment you have an opportunity for any possibility any timeline yes. you you want to choose and so yes. recognizing that that you are creating it actively in every now moment, yes. being able to practice, develop the skill to be able to put my Kuba filter so my perceptions are accurate or put the Rachma filter so that my intentions follow through on what it is that I want, my whole dream desire, any possibility yeah. that's available. I can have possibility and waiting in a long bank line just as easy as the possibility of me being um, put to the front of the line because, a, a, you know, a new teller opens up and they say, come this way, ma'am. That's right. Yeah. And one of the things that I feel is so important for people to get is that we are creators. We are creators in this reality. And the energy that we're operating in is what is going to bring events and people and circumstances into the world around us. And that is really amazing when we start getting that. And that's a kind of self-empowerment. You know, I say we're basically living in an ancient slavery culture. Well, how did it get that way? How did we get so oppressed or think that we're at the effect of everything around us? And I like to go back to the Adam and Eve story, you know, and I say, well, Adam said, oh, I didn't do it, she did it. And Eve said, well, I didn't do it, he did it, the serpent. 
you know, and the serpent goes, well, blah, blah, blah. But we basically, at some point, it's just a little story. And whether you see that as true or not, um, it's a mythos. It's a mythos of our civilization. And at some point, we gave up our responsibility. And we said, okay, I'll let the you know, the priests and the those who say they are the lords and those who say they are the gods, I'll let them rule me. And we gave up that we are creators in this realm. And I think that's been the really cool thing about our journey with ancient Aramaic and our learnings, you know, in retreats with um, Dr. Rice, with things like Landmark. I used to put Tony Robbins on stage, but it's restoring our sense of empowerment that I can literally change this world around me by changing myself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it's an experiential thing. I mean, we, we can talk about this all day and, and the True. principles look good on paper, but until you actually start to intentionally apply them and make a conscious choice to intervene on a negative thought, and reframe it and, and move it in, in a different direction is actually a, you know, a skill to develop, a muscle to strengthen, something that needs to be practiced. You know, if you imagine that was in Russian, you're not going to be conversational in Russian just because you, you listen to this broadcast. You, you got to start like learning the alphabet and then maybe some little words. And, and as you practice and then you, you get some results, you realize, ah, wow, this actually kind of works. And, and then it kind of fuels your enthusiasm. And, and again, it strengthens the neural pathways that you're developing. You know, most people that come to me for um, counseling are coming with well-worn neural pathways of negativity. Their, their automatic default is fear and hostility. And, and part of the um, education is just suggesting and helping them to understand that this is a choice that you're making in any yes. given moment, moment after yes. moment. Right. Yes, Berta, so glad to hear that you're enjoying it. So empowering, she says. Yes, fascinating. So we have, um, we, I think you and I both, it, and it's been a, a really a big personal journey, I think, for each of us to go through this process of waking up. You know, when I first, I mean, Michael Rice is actually an old friend of mine that I've known since 1980, so a really long time. But, um, and we've kind of been through a lot of the same training together. However, when I w went through a relationship ending and I started um, going to Michael's um, radio shows, which you actually are the moderator for, on, and he's on every day, five days a week. Five days a week, what's the saying? To meet every mind, heart, and being on the planet? Exactly. Exactly. And, um, yeah. No. Yeah. I um, I co-host from time to time. It's it's a it's part of the reason um he does that on a daily basis is because again these principles are not how we were acculturated and right. So it's a big jump to change your thinking on this and staying in the conversation on a daily basis is one of the most helpful ways that I've um experienced to help develop myself so that my new automatic default more often than not right is is a conscious awareness of love and peace and and realigning myself or being receptive to trusted friends who are around me who I've invited please give me feedback please let me know and please you know bring it to my awareness when you see me going back into my unconscious patterns because those, that kind of support is um, invaluable when it comes to moving in a forward direction so that, you know, the 24 seven experience of love, joy, and peace is, is truly available. Despite what the circumstances are, you know? True. I, I was gonna say when, when I first got into this and really kind of took it to heart, which was around 2012, 2013, I had had a relationship and, and I, and I started coming on and listening to Michael and he was talking about self-responsibility and how it really comes from inside of us. And, and I was just like, no, come on, it's gotta be at least partly his fault. You know, come on, it's gotta <laughs> be partly his fault. That's my favorite memory from that time because I had to go through this process of realizing it's all coming from inside of me. It is not 
partly his i mean we tend to come together with matching packs matching bags of garbage right um we yeah. come together with somebody where we have vibrational frequencies that are that are gonna trigger each other or activate An each opportunity other. for healing yes and um you know i'm in a relationship now where we speak our truth to each other and we take responsibility and that's just a completely different way to go about it you know than i ever had earlier in my life um so how was it for you when you first started michelle well Fortunately, I had a lot of proofing along the way. Um, I've, I've always been interested in growth and development. Um, as a child, my dad in Detroit used to take me to Wayne Dyer seminars. And um, I was his little companion. I would sit in the rows. I'm not even sure if I recall wow. any of the events. I just like being the grownups. But I, but I really, really do cool. think some of that... Um, planted seeds um brian tracy was another one we used to go watch and wow and he would listen i know to, wayne uh, dyer just help, passed help. Away at, wayne dyer just passed on a few yeah, years ago right is brian tracy still a around years ago yeah yeah he's, oh, go he's, ahead. he's um still actively you know um promoting his work i mean it's healing work and so i think that those um early experiences had me oriented to um like I said, growth and development. And I, my, my original career was in human resources. And so, you know, employee benefits and employee relation and, and things like this and um, corporate training. And so I was always put into um, opportunities for training. And, and at that time, it was the idea of just developing yourself as a professional business leader. And that kind of morphed along the way when I, um, I was at a seminar, a, a landmark seminar one, one weekend, and I started noticing all these really unusual coincidences, you know, these, these serendipity kind of things that, that I could not explain. Mm. Um, an example was I was sitting, there's a room of a hundred people and I'm, um, scratching the heck out of myself because I had, um, had a bad case of poison ivy and the woman next to me sees me suffering and then she opens her purse and she's like do you want some poison ivy cream now I don't know about you but I don't know many women who carry around poison ivy cream in their purse really? and I'm suffering from it and I sit next to this woman and so there was a couple other things that happened that this you know all in it like you know a one afternoon that started to feel like a little bit uncomfortable in the sense that like something's going on here and, and, and it's strange and, and unusual, but I don't know what it means or what is this all about? So I think that kind of um, led me onto a journey of, of, of discovering and, and being inquiring and curiosity. What is this stuff? And um, so during those those early years, I'm going to say that was in my 20s and 30s. Um, I think there was a lot of foundational work being done. Like I mentioned about the idea of possibility, they might have not languaged it um, as forgiveness work. But you know, when you look back, it's ultimately what what was being um, presented, but just in a, a different uh, language, in a in a secular language, let's say. So um, I experience all kinds of um, different ideas through Course in Miracles, for instance. Again, prep work, laying, laying foundation. So then when I kind of stumbled upon a, a workshop, Michael Rice travels all over the globe and he had come to Lansing, Michigan for, for a week. And, you know, again, my, my um, workshop junkie that I am, I like, yeah, let's go see what this guy's got to say. And I mean, after three hours that first day, I was just like blown away. It was almost like he had put a key into a lock of all these different un unrelated concepts and ideas that I had known and appreciated, but pulled it together in this most synthesized way that was just transformative. And, and 
I, I went the next night and I went the next night and I brought my kids and I brought my clients and I brought my husband and I'm like, come on, you guys, you got to see this guy is amazing. And the end of the week, he, um, uh, on the, on the weekend ended it with a breath session. You mentioned the breath before. And, um, that's a, that's a, you know, a sidebar we can talk about in a, in a moment, but there was a group breath session with, um, you know, about 20 people and we worked in dyads and take turns. I'm doing an hour and a half long breath session as a, as a way to augment the, um, intellectual and cognitive pieces of what we were learning in terms of forgiveness and healing. And then, supplemented it with this physical release of this aberrant energy right. that you know we all carry whether we know it or not. that's right and, and when, let's just let's just pause with that can if you can if you can remember where you're going because augmenting yeah, yeah, yeah. augmenting all this intellectual stuff with the breath work is really a beautiful way of st stating it because we do carry some things in our physiological structure you know our stuckness our emotions and then doing the breath work is a way to really release like the new understandings that we're getting to to go through that transformation it helps us go through that transformation instead of it just being a head trip right exactly um well, you know, um, what, uh, what I'd like to share here with your audience is the idea that when we're, we're children, usually, we, we, real, we recognize pretty early on that if we hold our breath, we don't have to feel as acutely the, the um, visceral feelings of fear or sadness or guilt or shame, right? Yeah. And so in order to avoid feeling that feeling, if we hold our breath, it's not as intense. However, the consequence of that um, habit is that you lock down that aberrant energy instead of releasing it through your breath to have it be gone from your body, you're actually storing it for later. And if you're doing this habitually throughout your whole life, each, each thought, there's a neuropeptide, there, it finds a receptor. And if you don't breathe it out, it just locks in. That's what they refer to as the issues in your tissues, right? And so reverse engineering that process by consciously activating your breath in a, in a um, connected way and raising the vibration of the body so that the sediment, this, this lower denser frequency can actually have a, a chance to come to the surface and then each out breath gets rid of it. It's just like sweeping a patio, you know, maybe That's you got to do that daily because. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> sweeping out the dust, sweeping out the dirt, and cleaning up our neurobiology right. our physiology. It's one reason I think the Wim Hof breathing is so popular. You know, he's popularized something that is actually cleaning up people's neurobiology, their whole psychobiology. It's helping them operate better and push past barriers. And some of these solutions can be so simple. You know, we can understand the more complex explanation of it, but we can also just do these simple things, you know, breathing, smiling doing some type of breath work, whether it's pranayama or whether it's the kind of breath work that you do with people or whether it's Wim Hof breathing. Do you actually do breath sessions with people, Michelle? I do because it's, it's kind of a two pronged approach. And from my belief system, there's, there's one, there's using your breath work to um, intentionally let go of the past traumas that you've stored but then also recognizing that as you move forward, practicing a continuous breath so that new um, situations where we might not be fully conscious yet aren't being stored for later. So there's cleaning up the old stuff and then preventing kind of new stuff from residing in, in your body. And all that helps to raise your vibration, raise your frequency, raise your vitality. And here's the thing, the more you raise your vitality though, the more, the deeper you can go in terms of healing that unconscious, like, Absolutely. you know, the unconscious, you know, they talk about rock bottom. Well, guess what? The rock bottom's got a trap door and yeah. there's more stuff to clean out. True. The stuff keeps rising up to the surface as we do that. Oh my gosh. And I talk about it as the iceberg, you know, what our conscious mind is aware of. And actually Harvard studies talk about this is 
5% of our thought is conscious and the other 95% is buried in our unconscious. So these parts and pieces of ourselves that are buried in our unconscious, like being afraid of something as a child, like you were mentioning when we held our breath or whatever, um, all those things begin surfacing as we begin sweeping away the dust and clearing away the things that are on the surface. I just wanna say, um, I'm Carrie Curisar Ellis, author of the 21st Century Superhuman books, and we're here on our 21st Century Superhuman channel on Twitch, um, new live streaming, and we're gonna be doing this every day, um, every other day for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from noon to two Eastern. And I have Michelle with me, who is a therapist and a wonderful world traveler. And we're talking about the ancient Aramaic healing process for one thing, and how breathing and smiling, just those simple things change our physiology and how to be self-responsible creators in our lives, that we literally have the ability to call people into our presence, to call events into happening. And it's by recognizing that our vibration, what we carry inside of us is what is literally activating this world around us. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Michelle? That activation, you've been um, activating a lot of things lately. Well, um, you asked me to remind me, um, remind myself where I left off on the story related yes. to that that breast sucking, yeah, uh, Michael, because I, I it was a um, a profound moment for me personally in terms of again, like these concepts sound lovely, they might sound exciting, but until you actually practice them and do them and have a, a result, they really aren't that significant. True. So. Um, for as long as I remember, um, you know, in childhood and then, and then just increasing more after my um, pregnancies in my late twenties, that I had um, an affliction, um, a problem, a spell where every four to six weeks, approximately, I would wake up um, fine. And as the day wore on, I would get more nauseous, more sick until eventually I started throwing up. And once I started throwing up, I really couldn't stop. My, my, it was like my whole GI tract was just um, overstimulated somehow. And it would usually take a day or two of being bedridden because the nausea was so intense and so wow. um, unrelenting that it became painful. Like wow. nausea be, is, is, is painful. So it was a kind of thing that I lived with, so to speak, because I, I did all the testing from a gastroenterologist that you could ever have. There was no findings. Um, it wasn't related to my cycle or greasy food or consumption of alcohol. You know, I try to sort of rule out all the usual suspects about why this would be happening to me and this like, you know, this very um, predictable cycle. Wow. Um, what, David, they took my gallbladder out um, oh. at, at one point because they thought that was the reason, right. you know, and I, I, I regret that decision. I didn't know what I know now. So, but we grow back um, organs too, so. Oh, we're, we're, we're yeah. We're growing I, I, back I organs too, so. Right. We'll talk about that some other day, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, um. I went to the, the, the week of workshops, you know, he, he, he presents um, a three hour lecture, you know, every night. And then I, I said, oh, okay, well, let's try out the breath session and, and came for a day. And I was, um, I had some experience with breath work, so it, it wasn't completely unfamiliar. And so during the breath session, I would say it, it was um, a rather odd one in the sense that I felt some sensations in my my tummy and, and my body that were a little bit um, different than other breast sessions. It almost felt like there was some suction cups like on my abdomen and then some like streaks of like fast wow. energy, like a lightning strike that, that I, that I remember thinking, what is going on? Wow. And then I, the next thought was keep your eyes closed, keep your, keep breathing. And so I'm Powerful. like, just let my body do whatever it was going to do. So the hour and a half or so about a breast session and it, it was over and I got up and I was like, wow, that was 
that was different. And, but each breath session is different depending on, on, you know, what your body's wisdom is that day. So I didn't really think much about it. This was over Memorial day. It's going to be eight years, um, this Memorial day. And as after the holiday and then into June, my birthday's mid July. And I realized that I hadn't thrown up since before the breath session. And then I was started to worry like, Oh my gosh, my birthday's coming up. I'm going to get sick on my birthday. It's going to be ruined. My birthday went on without a hitch. And, and then I, then I realized it was August and September. And finally at the end of the summer, I realized I haven't, I haven't gotten sick in three months. Nice. I haven't got, I, I, I haven't got sick again. The, that, that pattern, whatever it was about this, this cyclical vomiting thing is gone from my life without medication, without treatment, without any intervention yeah. by any medical professional, but rather the divine grace of God and my willingness to surrender to a breath session. Nice. There's some people really digging and your info, realize. Michelle. It's good. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Um, Kara, you know, um, well, I don't know if I should call you Kara or Carrie or, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for that. I, I don't know what you'd um, prefer. Either one. You can call me Kira. Call me Carrie. Either okay. one. Okay. Um, oh, no, I lost my thought. Um, well, you didn't get sick. You've never gone back to that pattern again. That's what's never incredible. Gone and those what do you think those shooting feelings were through you you know that went through you you think um, you reset neurobiology what do you what do you do you have well, any perspective on I, it I feel, well i i guess i labeled us at a psychic surgery meaning like an yes. energetic surgery because i think that you know there might have been some benevolent beings supporting my process unseen forces that you might label as um spirit guides or angels or just the prana like you mentioned the the life force the innate wisdom in our from our creator there was definitely more more going on than i was consciously aware of and i i don't know that i could ever label it other than the intuition knowing that i was not alone in that breath session that there, there was really cool. some, some kind of help going on. Very cool. But so that, that I, my, my income, think about this. If I'm getting sick every month and I have to miss a day or two of work, that's, that's 20% increase in my income just from not being sick. Wow. <laughs> plus just well-being, you know, plus feeling good, plus being oh, happy. Oh, yeah, there's that. Well, yeah, I, I mean, as a therapist. So I feel committed to my clients. So I always felt um, some guilt, maybe letting down my clients if I was too sick to come to a session and I had to cancel, you know, yeah. a caseload for the day. Yeah. And that was, you know what I mean? That added to probably the energetic negativity that I was experiencing. Right. However, um, you know, there was, there was just a, the right time and the right place. And I think, again, enough prep work that didn't, that didn't happen, you know, the first day. Um, True. well, I mean, it could have true. You really, but I also you think, you know, a lot of prep work to go into prep that work. of, and what was part of the prep work was what can you like define a little bit oh, of that? I, oh, Summarize it. Okay. Um, how would our, yeah. How would our teacher say it, kidda? All of the above. All of the above. Right. So, but you were kind of. I mean, I know I've been through Michael's workshops and classes, and it's kind of like digging into understanding how we hold these layers. I mean, we talk about our power person, our power person dynamic, who who at an early time in our life, we felt had more power over us than we did, you know, and all of us have it, you know, it, usually it's a parent, but it could be a teacher, it could be a sibling it could be i mean we have all these different things to dig into i'd like to talk about um breath work a minute because i think i'd like to encourage people to do some kind of breath work and i feel like um michael's work a lot of the roots of that i think come from the what am i thinking it's uh um leonard orr and the 
um, oh, rebirthing. rebirthing. Some of it comes from rebirthing. I think some of the roots came from that, but it's his own style that he's developed. Um, a lot of these, and then Wim Hof, I love doing Wim Hof breath work today, and I've done Michael's breath work over the years. Um, and then there's been years I've done pranayama with meditation and that sort of thing. But the idea of it usually, um, I think the ones that are very, that really move us are a circular breath. Um, would you say that in your experience where we're breathing in, breathing out? I was, I was taught that the pauses, I was taught that the pauses between the inhale and the exhale are mm -hmm. fear. That if you, if you, if you breathe in and, and from your diaphragm and pull the um, air up to the top of your lungs and right before your lungs are all the way filled, you just relax your diaphragm and let that air drop out. And right when you get to the end, before it's all empty, you resume the in breath. And again, right before it's going to be all the way full, just relax your diaphragm. It's, it's kind of like a respirator. I'm going to um, tense my throat a little so you can hear it's like, like <sighs> wow so if you think about like when you, when most people are crying this is one of the um applications that became most profound for me in in understanding and integrating this concept yeah so I'm... when you think about um crying. Like most people, yes. some people even, I used to call myself a professional crier because I could cry. I had no resistance to the process. I'd let it out. But if you actually think about what's happening when crying, you're, you're experiencing, like, let's just talk, look at sadness. A lot of emotions generate tears. Um, sadness and grief is, is one of the more um, popular energies that will generate water coming out of your face. So when pe most people are crying and they feel like they're letting it out and they feel good after a, a cry isn't completely accurate because if you're crying, most people cry like this. <laughs> right? Oh yeah. So what, what they're doing is intermittently holding your breath while they're moving that sad energy through their body. And I always tell people you're saving half of that crap for later. Why not just have the feeling of the sadness come through you and then consciously keep that circuitous breath, that, that, um, that rolling breath while you cry. And yeah, because it, it opens like a, you, it, it opens. And, and, um, I'll get to that in a second because where I was forced into an opportunity to actually discover this for myself, um, I thought was pretty mm -hmm. interesting. I was at a, a, a Michael Rice workshop and it was a very small group of people, just like seven people, like in a, in a small, like, you know, fireside chat around the teacher. Right. And so it was very intimate. And he was talking about honoring your mother and father, which I really had a strong resistance to coming from um, an abusive, emotionally and physically abusive childhood. I had no um, interest in honoring my mother. <laughs> mm. However, what this guy was saying up to this point made a lot of sense. So I considered, well, maybe, maybe even though I don't like this idea, maybe there's something here. I, I previously had, you know, the um, belief system, you know, first 20 years, shame on you. Next 20 years, shame on me. Come right. We're here. getting some really nice comments. Venata Qigong says, clearly both of these women have a vast wealth of information. Thanks, Venata Qigong. And useful, powerful, all well, good stuff. Thanks again. And um, and then and then Berta is saying um, she's reconnecting to doing her own breath work. So this is really nice. We're helping people activate. Hey. Oh. Don't, you know. So go ahead. Yeah. This is really, I mean... Uh. Breath work is about deep transformation and reconnection to self, reconnection to our core, reconnection to, and this proper way of doing breath work where we keep the circular breathing open. We're letting go of things that have been held on to. Bert is appreciating both of us. Thank you. No, I, um, I, um, I appreciate that you're reading the comments. I don't have access to that. And, and I'm glad right. that if, if something that you're sharing or we were sharing, it can be helpful to someone. 
Um, so in this particular um, lecture, he was, you know, going on and on about the value importance of healing, uh, healing those um, original relationships with our parents and honoring our mother and our father. So obviously something was resonating me in me um, that was beyond my conscious, you know, my, my resistance in my mind because I really started to feel emotional and it, it was really coming up hard, like all this sadness and all this regret, maybe guilt, I'm not really sure. However, because it was this small little lecture, I really didn't want to start making noise crying, even though what I really wanted to do was just go over in a quarter and sob my little head off. I call it funeral part wow. of crying, that just like right. <sighs> kind of crying. Right. So I decided that like, then the idea came, well, maybe I'll try to breathe through this sadness. And so very, very quietly, I was feeling the sadness and then started the connected breath. So sadness was moving through my body. I was breathing and moving the energy. No one, no one had any awareness that anything was going on with me. Kira, this part, um, I'll never forget my knees were wet. The reason my knees were wet is because my tears were coming out so hard and fast. It was projectile crying. It was like water was crying out of my face, but no, <laughs> no gasping, no like hesitation, just continuous. And, and I did this because for about you were 10 breathing or 15 through minutes. It. Because you were breathing, breathing through, through it. it. It was making them really flow. Nice. Well, and then go back to what your point was. It was like, let's say my I was feeling the sadness at a four when I started breathing. The more I um, was moving that energy, and the more I kept the breathing um, connected, then it started to feel like a six, and then it started to feel like an eight. And like, and there was a part of mine like, wait a second, this is getting worse. But it's almost like all the little sadness molecules like, get out, get out, get out while you can. She's breathing. Get out of here. Nice. And, and it, um, transitioned to the end of the lecture. And then my, my friend Rex spotted me and he re recognized immediately what was going on. And they kind of cleared the space, allowed me to go into a prone position rather than the seated position I was, and supported me very lovingly and gently to continue breathing for, you know, the next 45 minutes. Wow. And um, it was, it was really powerful and and I wow. remember when I finally sort of came to it then I looked up and I saw like half of that group all around me Ari, Rex, yeah. Michael, Jeannie all wow. like holding a space of love to support me while I was releasing whatever this trauma was from you know nice. my unhealed past right yeah. it was great. so cool beautiful and so after we that be kind of yeah, Berta for Life is appreciating us both. And um, Venata Qigong says, beautiful, um, just so you know you're... So with that kind of cathartic breathing and crying, did you notice a big change in your life? Yeah, my, my life started to blow up, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 not, and not so pretty much pretty ways. And that became um, a, a source of a resistance at first because I had to work through because here I am doing all these things that supposedly are, are moving me towards a greater experience of a more consistent experience of love, peace, and joy. And this bad thing is happening and this bad thing is happening. And I say bad in the sense that I was judging them as bad, okay? Uh -huh. The actuality is they were perfectly in divine order. However, my unhealed perception is, why is all this stuff happening? You know, it right. isn't until, you know, um, moving, using the same principles, the, the forgiveness work, the, the breathing. Um, when, I, when I mentioned all the above, right? Th that means at every level, you're supporting yourself in raising your vibration and your vitality. So what does that mean? Organic food, um, fresh water, um, adequate yes. sleep. Clean yes. air, you yes. know, gentle exercise, 
yes. all of the above because I'll, you know, try to put our foot in, in one of those arenas, but it's juggling balls. You got to keep them all going, yeah. right? To support. Benetta Chigan thought it was really cool that everybody sat around you and, he and held space for you to breathe. He was really touched by that. Well, that's what happens so, when you when you um, do this work and and attract conscious people who understand the work. You you become in alignment with people who love you know people who are um, more more uh, I guess willing more yeah consciously aware to yes they are a love being and that their job is just to love and support each other because any love and support you give to me you're giving to yourself and and they're right. and recognizing. And you're loving yourself by receiving those people into your world. I mean, we're love when we love ourselves, we pull in friends and companions and a supportive circle who love us and care about us, you know, and are kind and gentle to us and support us in our our healing too, you know. And everything again comes from us. It comes from our vibration. It comes from the resonance we're sending out brings in the world that surrounds us. So it, it, as far as what, what happened after, you know, integrating some of these ideas more um, consistently is in hindsight, I can see that these, um, these, these situations were really um, opportunities to clear house, let go of the things that no longer serve me even though maybe consciously I wasn't, you know, hanging on to unhealthy relationships for longer than was appropriate for me. Right on. And, and so it's almost like my resonance, my new resonance kind of repelled things that were not going to be in my best interest. Yeah. Like how cool is that? I mean, knowing you, you're a pretty, uh, you know, you're, you're a powerful, dramatic, bright, intense person. So I imagine your changes are, you know, like right in your face, right? Pretty like, intense. Sorry. And, and you know, totally. and, yeah. And I think it's true. I think the more we grow, the more we deepen our connection with self, with our clarity, with our knowledge that we are responsible for creating in our world, that suddenly things that are in our face like you know if something happens i mean like say i have anger come up i stub my toe i mean i don't get away with you know the universe conks me on the head i don't get away with um messing around anymore like my karma is instant the response of my world is instant like you want to feel something less than love then here we'll show it right back to you in your face because we're living in a world that is our mirror. It mirrors back to us the resonance that we're putting out. And that's a big learning curve to get that because our programming is so opposite. You know, our programming is, oh, it's their fault. Oh, they did it to us. Oh, we're victims. And we begin to learn that those words don't even exist in our world, right? So as we let go of, huh? <laughs> I was yeah. thinking, turn on any country uh, station, listen to some country music, and you can see the yeah. brainwashing. The somebody, the somebody done, somebody done somebody wrong song, right? Like, oh, somebody did this to me, did that to me. So the, so, but we're letting go of those, and and we start not even liking that kind of music. We start not even liking to be in environments that support victim consciousness because we know we are active creators and we what we see around us is a mirroring that tells us what we're carrying inside of us so and i and know i would add that go on you and i have been talking about this the last few weeks because we're also personal friends and you're going through a lot in your life right now which is kind of a wake-up call for you and when we have those things come up and we have to be able to say, this is coming from my resonance, how do I change my resonance? It's huge. I mean, this is a giant step in our growth. And I, I don't think it's ever easy, you know, to have to look at our world and go, wow, what am I doing? What is my old energy 
that I need to forgive or release, cancel, release, and let go of, as in the words of Yeshua in the Aramaic, so that this situation around me changes. And those are, those are huge lessons. They're huge. Well, the, um, the thing is, you can't, once you're awakened, it's not as easy to go back um, to sleep. Right. And so even though more, some of these term, um, turmoil is happening around me, utilizing the principles that kind of got me here and then continuing to use them while I move through these situations and, and shed these old that doesn't serve me, um, I realize that I'm, I'm moving through them with power and grace that yes. wouldn't be available. Other and what do we talk about the other I, day? I'm, I think it's. Go ahead. Sorry. I mean, well, I just think you know, like, these are the kind of things that bring a lot of people to their knees. We're talking about, you know, breast yes. cancer and divorce and my partner embezzled from me. I mean, like, heck up. yeah, right. They do bring people to their knees. And we and are looking at my, my daughter. Why are you being so nice to these people? We're getting but, a little. You know, it's just that, you know, other people around me. Like, yeah. Delay. Yeah. Go ahead, though. Uh, yep. We've been well, talking about lateral like, uh, things. People who are too. close to me. We were talking about lateral, lateral um, thinking. Yep. Right. So I'm. I'm. What I was just going to say was that as I use these tools, and I can remain joyous. You know, even if the bank account's low and I'm single and or, or I'm sick, it's kind of an unusual experience for for some people who are close around me. They're they're looking at me and like going, "Why why aren't you mad at that person? Why are you being right. so nice to them?" You know, because it doesn't really fit the. Actually, Kara, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I I just mentioned breast cancer, right? So um, while I was in surgery, my husband was um, obviously in the waiting room um, until I was going to be coming into recovery. And after, at the end of a couple hours, whatever, the surgeon, it was a, a female about 65 years old, she went into the um, surgical lounge to tell my husband that everything was okay. And that, you know, this is what they found. And this was a surgery and that I was doing fine. And, and she felt pretty confident about everything that happened. And near the end of the conversation, she said to my husband, um, I, I want to ask you something. Is, is everything okay with Michelle? Is everything okay with your wife? And he was like, huh? What, what do you mean? Is everything, anything okay with her? And the, and the doctor proceeds to say, well, you know, she doesn't seem to be taking this very seriously. It seems like, you know, she's like out of touch with, you know, the fact that she's got breast cancer. And it finally dawned on my husband what she was referring to was the fact that I had so much peace, love, and joy throughout my consultation leading up to it, the biopsy, the diagnosis, the prep work. I mean, I was, I was chatting up the nurses while they're giving me IVs to go under sedation, the whole thing. And she had never really experienced um, a patient with such a peaceful acceptance about, you know, a double mastectomy. Wow. And she that is assumed really cool. something wrong I'm, with my mental state. And right. he had to say, he's like, no, fine. Like, oh, I get what's happening. No, she's a therapist. She's, she's very spiritual. Like this stuff is like, she takes it and accepts it because, you know, that's just how she rolls. And I just, I, it was the most beautiful backhanded compliment I've ever had. Oh, that is really, that is really sweet. And I just want to honor you for, you know, really sharing the truth of your walk and your experience, because that's, you know, it takes a lot to just put ourselves out there and share it with others. But this is how we help. We help our brothers and sisters grow by sharing our journey. And this is how we begin healing ourselves and healing each other. So I just honor you for your beauty and your connectedness and your openness, your willingness to, um, you know, to just put yourself out there. Well, that, that's just a um, collateral bonus because the, the reason I am fully self-expressed is because I know that being open and honest and, and truthful as I can is the optimal way to live my life. And right. any resistance to 
probably some kind of fear, fear of judgment, fear of recrimination, fear of um, disapproval, whatever it is. Right. I'm trying to help a woman right now. One of my clients, she has is she had a, a double mastectomy a couple years ago, and she was they were asking for my records because she wants to go on disability like five years after the fact because of her breast cancer trauma. And she really has a belief that it's like forevermore negatively impacted her. Right. And, and so just as a contrast in terms of right. like, you know, the choice and how, you know, is breast cancer here to kill you or is it here to let right. you know, Hey, Michelle, you're not doing enough self nurturing. You're so into right. the other people. You're not taking care of yourself. So that, that aberrant energy, again, the neuropeptide, it found some tissue in my breast to reside in. And it, it, there it, it collected cancer cells came to wall off. So I didn't destroy my whole body, but it was there to let, give me a message that you're not nurturing yourself enough, girl. You're not putting, right. you know, what you hope, dream, desire in front of anything else. Right. Very cool. Really, really cool. Let's talk a little bit about deepening the journey. Because I think a lot of us, I mean, let's talk first of all about what's happened this last year with COVID and the kind of distancing, you know, what's happened. I mean, I think it's really made a lot of people have to look inward because it's quieted people's lives. It has, um, we're not going to get all today right now into the political ramifications and all of the additional things that I may think about it, but um but just in light of our personal growth and, you know, people have had income sources taken away. They've had family contact taken away. They've had churches taken away. People have been discouraged. Um, and, but also one of the, some of the good that's come from that is people getting to look inside and say, who am I really? What do I really want? What is my truth? Um, how am I going to live? And I think this, I mean, I know, every day I am in the process of deepening my journey. You know, it's not like it just is uh, something that I do for an hour and then it's not part of me, it's always here. But I know you've been through a lot of journey deepening things lately and we've had some discussions about that. Uh, what do you think about like some of the keys are and how we look inside and what comes up when we start doing that. Any thoughts? Well, I feel like some of this stuff I don't consciously plan for, that it just sort of evolves into the next opportunity for healing. And I've, I've kind of trained myself to um, subscribe to the belief that whatever um, the universe presents, your job is to say yes. And kind of trusting that by saying yes, even though it's unknown, leads you to a, a greater level of um, enlightenment. And I think, you know, that's my personal way of doing it. I, I really I love that. You know, I love so that movie. You remember the movie, Yes Man? And everything that happened in his life, he decided he was going to say yes to. And funnily, okay. funnily enough, that was kind of a turning point for me. It was like, instead of complaining or trying to steer it differently, I just started saying yes. You know, when something would happen, I'd go, okay, what am I being called to in this situation? And, um, and I think it is, you know, opening up and being able to see. And part of that is that the matrix, the system around us can only mirror back to us what is coming from inside of us. And again, it's going back to self-responsibility. So what in we as a collective created this system change that's happening right now that we're really still in the midst of? And how do we dig deeper in the midst of that and search for the pieces inside of ourselves that give us the clues to how to move forward and how to move forward. You know, like suddenly, you know, you have, we have something that you'd consider negative happen and you go, well, how do you turn lemons into lemonade? And, you know, you just told us 
a couple of stories of you personally, but we have a whole culture now who are, I mean, I think of how ingrained we've been in living for maybe a lot of things that are not really true to our hearts. Well, you know, I have to support my family. I have to support my kids. I was raised to, um, you know, that I should do some career. And so I'm doing that career. And I don't even think we're designed to do the same career for without change, you know, for 50 years or whatever. Like we are creative amazing beings and how do we add new parts and pieces to who we are and what we're doing um but i feel like we well, really... one of my favorite quotes is... yeah go ahead oh, I was gonna, i'm insert this because it's resonating what what um one of my favorite quotes is whatever the present moment contains accept it as if you had chosen it meaning that you just embrace it all that's beautiful the judgment we... is and that because we really have chosen. I mean, the judgment of it is what keeps us up. Right. Um, you know, when it, when it, oh gosh, I was, um, this was last year, right before COVID in February, I was in Aberdeen, Virginia. Michael Bryce had had, um, he was doing a 16 days laws of living, right? And I've already been through that a couple different times, but I just wanted to go for the breast session, right? So I drive from Michigan to Virginia on a, on a you know, Friday morning, so I can get there for a Saturday morning breath session. That's how um, how much I cherish um, a good breath session because there's a group dynamic, especially is even more powerful than doing it on my own. And so I was, I met this new guy, and and I was sharing my story and and some of the things that I was going through. And he knows, um, you know, that I have, um, have done a lot of work and as a, a therapist and a, um, that I apply the tools, you know, on a daily basis, one of my clients. So I'm, I'm pretty knowledgeable. And he just looks at me and he says something like, what was it exactly? Um, Michelle, it's exactly the way you want it to be. And I was like, I want to, I want to like smack him kind of like, what the, ah! damn it. He's so right. And, and it just, it was a great reset and to sort of take off another layer of blame and shame that, that I put on everybody and everything except for me. And this is by my design. And as much as I want to whine and complain that I don't like something, truth be told, it is of my manufacture, my manifestation, right. my creation. Right. Berta for light says yes we're always evolving yes we are um yeah i feel like we've had a lot of a lot of things up in the mirror this past year um venado qigong it's exactly like you want it to be yes um and we are we are literally a resonant creator in this field and I think that's part of this wake up process. You know, why is there so much chaos among humanity? Because I call it um, uh, cognitive dissonance. And it's when we've believed certain things are true for so long and suddenly we're having to completely rewire how we thought. And whatever we have believed to be true, whatever it was, you know, was maybe a program in a system that kept us running according it kept us on this one track you know i have to support my family i'm not worthy unless i'm working um i have to pay my mortgage i have to pay for my car i have to make money um you know i mean we have these all have to's and this path that has been built up in our society and culture and yet the questions i always like to ask people and i think covid has put us in a position, it's created this chaos where things are unstable, where everything that we thought was a structure that worked around us suddenly is questionable. And that, and then having to ask ourselves, what is real for me? What is truth for me? Who am I really? What do I wanna be doing? How would I change my life? Um, these questions then the, the battle between the two of these things then creates cognitive dissonance, which is 
oh wow i don't know where my stability is anymore i don't know where my where my solid footing is because we're having to learn a new path we're having to learn a new way to be and um i mean i think we should talk about um you have spent a couple of months on an adventure visiting us and you've been getting to wake up you know every day with a lot of the pressures that you've had in your life um, taken away and or lightened and looking being able to access part of your own soul part of your own consciousness part of your own presence part of the the true desires of your heart and so do you want to share a little bit about how that's been for you i mean these well, are the things yeah go ahead well I, I you know i'm 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 still integrating um a lot of my experience over the last several weeks and so you know i think that you know my understanding of it is is still developing in terms of um you know evaluating what is actually changing and and how, what that means for future of me uh let me see it, it's where do i want to start with that what one it's a it's kind of like you know the the classic analogy about a fish doesn't know it's in water when when you when i'm removed 3000 miles away from my normal normal um environment in, in america and and coming into a place that's like simplified in 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 just the basic important things in life are are being presented not all the distractions not all the drive through <laughs> Starbucks, the, the shopping malls, the, the TV programs, the social media, all, all these distractors that you'd, I didn't even recognize were like chipping away at, at me because I was the fish in the water. And, and so like, it looks good on paper. I mean, you can tell people these things, but until you actually experience it, for yourself, you really can't even understand the concept. It's true. It's true. Yeah. It, wait, taking away the structure where we're just feeling this pressure and getting the sensory input every day, you know, cars and traffic and shopping malls and um, expectations Con of family, of society. What? What did you Concrete. say? Concrete. Concrete. Yes. And you begin taking those things away. You really can't even explain to somebody what that's like until you do it. And I think that takes a, a little willingness to go on an adventure, to step out of our normal zone and experience ourselves without so many layers over the top of us and try and remember who we really are. Well, you know, you're talking about the the bigger society, and that's absolutely true. But even just within the, you know, um, the perimeter of my home, let's say, I mean, the reason people right. go on vacation, because they want to escape all the silent messages that all oh. the stuff is giving them all the right. time, clean me, dust me, you know, play with me, you know, um, organize me. Um, store me. And, and when that accumulation and all those messages just from the physical things, you know, the, the pile of clutter on your counter or, you know, um, you know, I, don't, I, I guess you can use your own um, examples to understand that when, when that part is removed and you're just sort of simplified to the basics, you know, I'm going to market every day to buy fresh food so that I can have something to eat tomorrow and then doing that again the next day and you know kind of really um eliminates a lot of mental distraction i guess that i didn't even recognize was there because i'm you know um so i have so much energy that it's just you know all over the place and i still have enough to handle my, my business but wow once i took away all that um diluted and diverted energy and just brought it back into me 
all this other stuff gets activated in terms of my intuition and my psychic abilities and my abilities to channel information or or just connect with like um a higher um version of myself like on and on and on like wow i didn't realize how many anchors were were pulling me away from myself and knowing myself who who i really am hey blink and the beaver welcome to being here Oh, those are interesting pictures. I think maybe somebody might delete those. <laughs> Moderators. Thank Bless you. them here. Bless them and, and have them find a new chat True room. That. True that. Yep. So uh, let's, um, yeah. So what we were just talking about as far as as far as what um, what comes up when all of those layers are taken away, you know what what is it that happens inside of us when the layers are taken away? Um, do they what happens? I mean, and and that transformation. I've been on this journey for a few years now, so talking to you when you're kind of fresh out of the pot you know you're you've been cooking for a little bit in this um <laughs> allowing allowing yourself to be free from the really um intense pressure and you're feeling your energy coming back and your the synchronicities are happening and your sensitivities to life um what it, can you tell us a little bit about what that is like well, you kind of touched on it earlier in terms of um, a quickened, um, a quickened feedback loop in terms of like putting your your thoughts and intentions out there and then getting you know results. Um, you know, I've I've noticed that I've had um, like I something. Excuse me. Um, something as simple as, as having improved client sessions for, wow. for some reason, a, a, um, a pure, more loving experience of myself is able to like come through just nice. naturally, not with me having to think, okay, I'm going to be aligned my piece because this person's, you know, really triggers me just sort of a, more of a natural expression. Um, I think, um, we all we all know those like high moments where we where we feel that alignment, but it's kind of like instead of just these random experiences, I'm stringing more together, more more frequently for longer duration and and um, more often. But uh, but again, um, some of the, some of these questions are um, harder to language because I am right. still kind of you know I'm trying to. <laughs> assimilate what happened, you know, the week before and the week before and the week before there's, you know, just a lot of um, opportunity when, when you take away all the distractions and again, like why people like to go on vacation, but I, I guess my um, consideration is how I'm going to maintain this awareness and this um, kind of outlook and this appreciation when I return to um, Michigan next week. Right. Yeah. That's going to be the, the real challenge, you know, is being able to um, apply these principles more um, consistently. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think we all, I mean, I know that I, I think for me, when I first started doing this and letting myself be in different environments than the ones where I feel really pressured because of so many external things, it took me a long time to relax and to let go of feeling like, you know, waking up in the morning and feeling like, oh my God, you know, where's the pressure, you know, you know, that I'm so used to feeling and then feeling it start going away. And, um, and now, I, I mean, I think I spent years just waking up in the morning, kind of feeling like panic, like, how am I going to deal with everything I need to deal with? How am I going to deal with 
you know, this or that in my life, you know, and I had a whole list of things. And now I wake up in the morning and I just go, okay, what am I going to create today? But, you know, I think a thing that makes me curious is how can people create longer vacations for themselves? Because you're using the word vacation, which is great. So um, for you, you've been able to do an extended vacation. Thanks to COVID, you could still work remotely. And um, maybe a lot of people still have that opportunity right now. You know, a lot of people are working at home or working online and they could potentially go on an extended vacation and be able to um, you know, get out from under that normal pressure that they're under all the time. But, um, you know, I wonder how people can program for themselves, take a longer vacation, whether there's COVID or not, but, you know, to have enough money to be able to pay their bills while they're gone and to be able to just keep moving and expand what they're experiencing in life so that there can be a letting go of layers that have been driving the boat for a long time. Are you okay, Michelle? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm the, the, the um, animals are bringing um, some very interesting roadkill uh, to the yard and I'm oh, a little, fun. I got distracted a second. Uh, um, I think, you know, as far as the idea of um, putting yourself in a, in a physical environment that supports that kind of transformation is only limited to your beliefs or restrictions about it. You know, if, if thinking about that possibility seems impossible, guess what? You'll be right. Versus, wow. Well, let me, let me let the universe handle the details. I want to have this intention and um, let me live into it. And then creator starts paving the way for um, things to happen. I mean, when I look back um, to the invitation um, related to getting away that happened to December, I can probably go back to November and, and think about how I really had... Um, a conscious intention to move through the end of my divorce with grace. And that really, uh, even though I've been doing um, a lot of work on it for many years, that I was still needed to detach. Somehow there was something that was still like an etheric cord or something um, having me overly attached to this relationship. And then the next month, an opportunity came up that I was like, again, the universe presented it, I say yes. And so I think that, you know, maybe is a, is a way to approach it, just having the intention, the willingness, and then let the universe handle the details versus you coming up with an idea and then your, um, you know, rational mind giving you all the reasons why that wouldn't work. Right. Yeah. There's so many things that hold us back. There's, and again, it's being ingrained in the in ingrained in the system the way that we have been for a long time. But I just want to encourage people, you know, if you have a chance, we're 21st century superhuman, and we're here to help you begin feeling more freedom in your life. Because the truth is, we really are already free. What we need to do is just begin claiming that. And how do we claim it? You know, what's holding us back? What's keeping us like feeling pressure, feeling worry? Um, and how can we begin being a vibrational creator and say, I'd like to have more abundance flowing in my life. I'm breathing, I'm smiling, I'm centering in love. I am holding the field for new ways of being to come into my life. I really appreciate you being here today, Michelle. This has been really fun. It's very cool to get to have a kind of a really just natural conversation with you and talk about real life stuff. Um, anything else you can see in your vision for the future, where we're going, what this, what we're creating right now, and how each person actually the idea. Up? 
the idea that came to my mind, you know, for you, you know, a question that I'd like you to field is knowing that we've been um, indoctrinated or acculturated with these scripts. Yes. Um, and you know our our rate uh, our upbringing that when you when you talk about like following what's in your heart I think some people have been well I've been so um removed for that for so long because my focus of attention was elsewhere and other people yeah. or or you know um following the rules or you know doing the you know get married have 2.5 kids get a house blah 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 have a successful career retire and die like that that um, like brainwashing is is so prevalent that even you know I'm I'm clearing a lot of it. It still um, remains a mystery at this point about well, how do you evaluate what's really in your heart? How how do you know the difference between True. what was um, you know gifted to you by loving people before? <laughs> Or, you know, is this really what, what move touches inspires me? It makes my heart sing. Right. Yeah. That's a really good question. And, you know, I, I will go kind of back to the roots of this, which are, we do live in the times of great change. We do live in the shifting of the ages where we're literally coming out of like 12,500 years of darkness and we're going into a cycle, a light cycle, where light is pouring into the planet from um, the sun, the central sun, whatever, wherever light comes from, even according to NASA, um, the that this light is coming in, we are being pushed, we're being pushed to wake up, um, our DNA coding is changing. And our DNA is like a little antenna that reads the electromagnetic spectrum coming to us. And so as we feel that, I, I think the, I, I love the Native American um, saying where um, it's a Navajo saying, it's in my books, but the river is moving very fast. And there will be those who want to hold on to the shore, hold on to the roots along the shore, but don't hold on to the shore. Look in the water and see who's flowing in the water with you. And this could be a very good time. And he claps his hands. So I think a lot of us are feeling pressure, um, but we don't necessarily I think it's that waking up that is, wow, what do I do with this? That feeling pressure that old things make me feel like I'm supposed to be doing this and that, but I'm feeling this emerging self of who am I really? And in the midst of all of that, and my question I always like to say to people is, if you didn't have to make money and if you didn't have to do anything else, what would you do with your life? And a lot of times when I say that to people, especially if I just say it to an everyday person, like a taxi driver, you know, a lot of times people just kind of roll their eyes and go, um, you know, wow, I've never even thought about that. And so to uh, the, what I like to say is what is inside you that never leaves you? What have, what's been there your whole life? You know, is it like for me and my answers to that are, um, you know, and I've been doing this my whole adult life, what I'm doing right now. I mean, not this specific thing, but I've been running workshops and, um, and, and health center, alternative health centers and different things to give people a path of waking up. So for me, it has been the waking up path. It's been taking care of the body, um, living a healthy lifestyle. And those are the things, those are like the things that I get really excited about. And, so I think what give, what gives us, Tony Robbins used to tell us, it's one muscle that's the difference between smiling and frowning. And <laughs> what is it that really, what is it that turns us on? What is it that turns our crank? What is it that we get excited about? What do I wanna talk about? You know, like a lot of times, you know, I could sit around in society and just not say anything and let everybody else talk and not have any interest in what they're talking about. But if I bring up what I really want to talk about, it's healthy lifestyle. It's how to be a free soul. It's how to be awakened, how to live our utmost, you know, those are, but you know, it's not the same for everybody. Each person has their own thing. Some people want to be an artist. Some people want to, 
um, go hike mountains, you know, some want to help people with therapy, you know, I mean, everybody's got a different thing inside of them. But what is it that moves my soul? What's been with me that never leaves me? And that is the second question I ask behind, and you could do whatever you wanted to, what would you do? And then the, my back question to that is, what is in you that never leaves you? And you kind of bopped out for a minute there, Michelle, but it's that second question is what's in the, in you that never leaves you. So those are kind of my path to unfolding this because it's really, a, um, I think it's a very big deal for feeling like, you know, the energy, like, rattling us rattling our cage and saying who are you really in there what do you really want to do what do you want to be when you grow up you know and i lived in the southwestern united states for many years uh, southwest colorado and i went to the anasazi ruins and one of the things one of my favorite things i remember from the anasazi ruins is the people had enough they were growing enough corn they had enough corn and squash and beans so at that point they started sewing flowers on their moccasins and it's like we have a lot of cultures in this world like the united states canada europe eastern europe western europe um where the majority of people have enough we have enough food we have enough we, we don't think we have enough a lot of times. We think, oh, I don't have enough. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough of this. How am I gonna do this? How am I gonna do that? But we really do have enough. We have enough food. We have enough to take care of ourselves. And at that point, you know, we spent our lives accomplishing that. At that point, how can I serve? How can I serve the greater good? How can I sow flowers on my moccasins? You know, what's the next step beyond this, beyond just the, going through the process of creating enough food, enough shelter, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, Maslow's hierarchy of values is, you know, I can't sow flowers on my moccasins. I can't do what I dream of until I have food, shelter, water, sanitation, education. And um, we're involved, my husband and I are involved in a number of humanitarian project processes to create. And we know, like, there's, thousands of people around the world now who want to help create programs to help others who don't have enough food, shelter, et cetera, and education, proper media. You know, we have so many things to correct on the planet. So can we who have enough begin, become creators of beauty, of beauty and consciousness and how we do that is going to be up to us the soul what is our mission what is our purpose what did we come here for none of us are here on earth at this time by accident you know we are here in the great shift of the ages we said like i say about you you're from the stars you're this beautiful radiant being you know and we jumped in and we said okay i'll take that body i'll take that family karma i'm willing to work through life in that way and i will help be a, a, a participant in this evolutionary process that's going on right now. So, you know, I think that ultimate question, who am I, what I'm doing, what am I doing? And we can look at this whole history of humanity that's come through people warring against each other, people oppressing each other, and those who had greed and wanted to hold on to all the resources, um, making other people suffer because of that, um, we still can go to the that place that says, I chose, I chose as a soul, as a being, as a journeyer in this realm to live, to live this experimental game and see what it's like to live outside of love. And as I wake up, I begin moving into love for myself and then for others. But as I move into love for myself, I'm going to begin seeing a different mirroring in my world. And then I'm going to 
maybe new choices are going to come up for me because you know as we start doing that lateral thinking as we start thinking i don't just have this one path i have many solutions and i have many solutions that are different directions than i've been looking before and as i begin living some of those solutions I begin following some of those paths, more doors open for me. And I always say, every time I walk through a door, a new one opens. So I don't know, that's kind of a long answer to a short question, right? That's my, my, my kind of way of unwinding this awakening process that I feel like a lot of us are in. I think all of us are in it. I don't think there's any escape, actually. I think we are in, we are on planet Earth, we are in this game of life and we are getting to experience what it is like to live one way and then to begin waking up and say man i don't like that way so much i think i'm going to find a new way but what is that new way i need to go on an exploratory adventure i need to ask myself some questions i need to talk to my partner and um i don't know what do you think about all that well, you know, I'm listening to you and, and recognizing that the information we're, we're providing, you mentioned like, you know, talking to a taxi driver and, and there's almost like an education for, for, for some people to actually um, introduce these concepts. Then I also know people um, and, and sometimes younger generation people who are doing this without any big, you know, deliberation. And I haven't, haven't told you this um, yet. It just happened last night, but I think it's a wonderful example that embodies everything that you're saying right here, right now. I got a call um, from my son in Arizona. My son's 25 years old. He, as a firstborn, he was always um, a very bright and very, um, you know, ambitious um, student. He ended up um, at University of Michigan um, studying aerospace engineering. He walked on to the cross country and track teams because he thought it would be a good way to make some friends like as a social group. Um, they ended up redshirting him and, and giving him scholarship because his performance was so um, incredible. He, end, he ended up with a gold medal in a 5K because wow. he ran it in 15 minutes. Wow. During that that last year of college, his fifth year, he got a master's in electrical engineering. So he has, you know, um, a, a double major with a master's. He's um, recruited by Raytheon, which is a, a prestigious um, aerospace engineering company in Arizona. And he moved there after college. They waited for him, of course. Um, and he's making six figures. I went to visit this, my boy, um, at Christmas. And both he and um, his sister agreed, or I mean, I mean, my daughter and I both saw how um, disengaged he was from us. I mean, here it is Christmas and he's in his, um, you know, bed sleeping and or playing video games and just really um, kind of dissociated from, from, you know, being together as a family. And it was obviously that he was depressed. And I'm aware that he, uh. he like his job, he, um, you know, sits behind a computer all day, nine to five, whether it's, you know, at the office or at home with COVID doing this, you know, mundane engineering work. And it was sucking his soul dry. So yesterday this call, and I was like the last person on his list, actually, he'd already um, called his uh, dad and his, um, and his roommates and some of his friends around the country to announce to us that he was quitting his corporate job. He wow. had purchased a van from a guy in Florida that was fully equipped with, um, you know, a stove and, and water containment and things like this. Wow. He um, figured out a way to um, saddle multiple um, internet connections together, tether them together, bond them together somehow to be able to stream from wherever he goes. And so his idea and concept, he's been researching this for a while, but he's ready to pull the trigger, is to set aside a year, 
to travel all over the country, um, particularly the, um, you know, uh, Northwest to go to San Francisco and Washington and Oregon and Grand Canyon and live stream in these remote um, locations as a niche market for what he likes to do on Twitch and doing what he loves to do, not, um, wow. you know, behind the desk, but for, you know, he, he saved enough money to set aside. I've got this much budget and I'm going to, I can um, pay all my expenses and um, I forgo my um, house. I'll, I'll, I'm giving away all my stuff to Goodwill. You know, I'm going to take a couple uh, mementos home to Michigan when, when, after I see him, but he's, he's done. He's like checked out in this, in he's 25, he's 25 rock years old. On. What did you rock on? I what know. did you, what did you say? What did you say to him when he told you? Oh my, what did you well, say? I, I um, absolutely said you, not only am I so glad that you're doing this. I'm so glad you're taking responsibility for your depression. And we just moved into the ideas of, uh, of, you know, um, logistics, some things to consider because, you know, I, I, I do have more experience on the planet, even though he might right. be an older soul, I've got some nuts and bolts that were helpful. You like, oh, I never thought about that part of it, mom. So that That's was cool. great. But the best part about the conversation, because at one point, um, you know, when I, when I heard about, like, he was explaining to me about the internet connection and being able to stream and, and, you know, from something as remote as the Grand Canyon, where there isn't a cell tower for, you know, millions of miles, but that I go, can I go with you? And he just started yeah. laughing, right. And he goes, oh my God. He goes, I totally predicted it. I told my friends that when I tell my mom, she's going to want to come with me. <laughs> that is so um, cool. That, he, um, he fully expected me, um, which is um, a nice compliment too, to be supportive and encourage him and, and, you know, don't even think twice about this son, go forward. And, you know, this boy, yes, um, fabulous. So I, I remind you, let me ask a couple questions. Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. And, well, no, I, I remind him that, that when he was in second grade, that um, I had him reading books like Manifest Your Destiny, Wayne Dyer. I, I passed it on, right? And so right. Um, he goes, yeah, yeah. He goes, I don't want to hear about manifesting. Like he, he doesn't use the same language and, and framework for, that I do, but he's doing right. the same thing I promote and that I encourage with my clients, really um, cool. try to practice myself, you know. It's like, oh my gosh, this, this um, I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of him for quitting his, so you know, Big job. That is really cool. So let me ask you a couple questions. One, number one is if you were not where you are right now and he told you this, would you have been as excited about it? Yes. Yeah. I I, I, I have to say okay. that my daughter and, and son have always um, been very... Um, Plants by Fred. I started with Castaneda. Guess I'm old. Oh no, I. I Plants um, by Fred said I started with Castaneda. Oh, oh, oh! As far as like Castaneda, awakening a uh, journey. Not old wise, says Berta for light. Yeah. Listen, so this is really exciting and I'm like so proud of him and you. And the other thing I want to say about it is. I believe, and I talk about this all the time, one of my new books coming up soon is called Star Seeds Guide to Planet Earth, that you came ah. from the stars. I believe also you opened up a gateway for him to come from the stars and you're holding space in a way that maybe a more old paradigm human couldn't have held space for him. And these young people that are coming in, and I'm getting chills just talking about it, they're coming in with advanced DNA, they're coming in holding the keys to the future. And most of them do not want to participate in the old system. They already know there's something wrong with it but they don't really know what yes. to do. So they, you know, yeah. the 35 year olds, the 35 year olds are pretty, you know, most of, a lot of them have found a way to operate in the system, but not be too controlled by it. And then the 30 year olds are figuring out better ways to be a little more out of the system. And then even to the people that are in their twenties and most, a lot of them are, and we see them where we are, 
travelers from all over the world. I mean, literally, you know, there's the van life now. Like I follow a whole bunch of van travelers on Instagram. They're a blast. Well, um, he, you can add my son van, to list. Yeah, I can't wait to know who he is so I can follow him because I'm really excited for him to be doing this. It's fabulous. And, but this, these young people, they came in with an embodiment of how to live as a being who is present and accounted for and who's living in love and it's why he was depressed at his job you know i mean why he couldn't thank thank god he could get the energy inside himself to just say this is not for me and to know that he wouldn't get too held back by you you know oh, i mean, no. if you're the kind of parent that said no son you know you've got to do this you put all this investment in it or something i mean look how yeah, go ahead. He he labeled it um, a journey of self discovery. I'm like, oh la la. Yes. Okay. And interesting. Perfect. The 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 you know stepdad, the dad that I'm talking about, who is divorcing me, had that kind of feedback for him. Very rational, very pragmatic, very you know, are you sure kind of um, message. And and it, it just made me feel even um, more aligned with love for right. You know, Right. Very he, cool. He, my husband is at where he's at. And, and, you know, um, until it might, you know, it may be a while till he starts to recognize what I feel like I'm recognizing, but so glad that my son, um, is following, you know, kind of where I left off at, at his age. I, I wish I would have, um, had the courage that, that he has to do something so radical and against every, you know, sensible, um, sensibility. And maybe he'll lead the way for you a little bit too. And the children like shall that. lead them. Isn't that the old quote, the children shall lead them. I, I hear you, Carrie. But but you, when you were first talking about the that sun energy and that that every one of us is swept into this um, forward movement, um, remember the night before? I mean, this was this happened last night. The night before that, my best friend from high school, who's my age, uh, fifty five years old, tells me that she's selling her house, packing up her possessions, giving away what she can, and is going to you leave her nursing job at the VA, very stable, you know, insurance providing job, and go bum around Europe for however long she wants, living with the locals, working as a barkeep or, you know, barista, whatever, maybe a, as a nurse, but that she too wants to break out of this mold and spend her whole life doing and giving to other people and finally recognizing, whoa, what about what I want? Mm. Half my life's over. Right. Uh, hello. Let me go. Let me have a Yay. turn at the wheel. So yeah, yeah. everybody and is just like, you know, maybe, maybe kiddo, maybe that has something to do with my because my son told me yesterday he's been thinking about it for two months. And this is where he at after two months of thinking. When did I get here? Two months ago. You know, me, you know, is, we're all energetically yeah. connected. Really you know, cool. maybe Berta for light says, aren't the children our teachers? And one thing I'll say, um, I studied with Dr. John Ray and it's through him in the early eighties when we fixed a broken arm that I had with body electronics point holding in a matter of three hours. I no longer had a broken arm. Doctors wanted to do surgery and put two pins in and he we used to do these point holding sessions with 100 people in the room and we would we went through classes with him and as soon as you started working on somebody and their spine would start straightening out everybody else in their family was having their spines moving or needing to go to the chiropractor so we are so connected our dna is so connected to, especially to the ones we're the closest to and so as soon as a consciousness movement happens in us it is going to happen as a domino effect through the rest of our family and then those surrounding us without us ever even having to say anything that is really the truth and you are you just shared a great example of that because and remember how sick you were when you came how you so knew sick. you you knew you were going into a huge change you knew you were a bunch of your old stuff was up and it was saying 
oh my God, we're going to have to let go. We're going to have to let go. And look at you now. I mean, you're just radiant and I'm so stoked for you. Stoked <laughs> for your son. Like how cool. I can't wait, Michelle. The van life is calling. Um, Kidda, you know what, what, um, what the, the person who is going to be impacted the most is Alyssa because there's no way Aaron and I can move forward and she's left behind. So, so you know, I'm just waiting for Alyssa's right. declaration. Mom, I'm moving to Europe. Yeah. I was thinking that as soon as you said it, I was thinking, oh, here goes Alyssa. She's going to go too. And, um, you know, it'll go out from there like ripples in a pond. That's what it does. And that's what quantum physics says. And I talk about this in my books. Um, our thought, our breathing, our smiling, our accessing our true self, our living our radiance is like the frog just kicking its leg in the pond and a ripple goes out from there and it affects everything. It affects the whole. It can't help but affect it. And that's why it's so important for us not to get caught up in, oh, ain't it awful. Like among my circle of friends where we understand this, we talk about the oh, ain't it awful concept. Like, oh, ain't it awful what's happening in the news? Oh, ain't it awful? I watch TV and I heard this today. Vanado Chingong, the van life is calling. Woohoo, yeah. And so letting go of these um, negative thought forms, there's no reason to be thinking in a way that is. Um, angry at other people, you know, a lot of what was stirred up recently in the election on social media, censoring, you know, people battling each other, like all that, we need to let it go. And what's so important is that we, we find the joy in our own life, we breathe and smile. And we allow what is in our own heart, our own soul, our own true reason for being Berta for light says, sign me up. Um, you know, we are here to be radiant beings of light. It's what we were born as, as divine humans. And it's time for us to reclaim that. So we really, truly are already free. Um, and I'm going to just say thank you, Michelle, so much for being here with me today. It has been really fun. You're welcome. You're most welcome and deserving, kiddo. <laughs> and... Um, and meanwhile, I'm going to just tell everybody as we sign off here, um, thank you. I want to thank Bernardo Chingung, Berta for Light, um, Plants by Fred, and the few more people that have been traveling through our stream today. Call your friends, tell your friends, help our stream grow. Um, we're going to be here discussing really cool topics every day for um, every other day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and then Saturday evenings um, on twitch.com, twitch.tv at the 21st Century Superhuman Channel. And you type that in, I think, without spaces between the words. But anyway, Michelle, thank you so much. And this is a grand adventure we're on together. I'm so glad we're friends. I'm so glad we have had so much common learning. Um, we are part of what's called a community, a community of growth, a community that's joined by us sharing our truth with each other, sharing our hearts with each other, sharing tools with each other. And as we share those tools and we um, use them, we begin growing our community. And this is what we want to do here is grow a community of people that are on their own path, on their own path of joy, of consciousness, of learning how to really activate who they are in this world so that we've got planet Earth changing because of all of us, not because of just a few. And it takes a few out on the front lines, but it takes every single one of us being in our heart, breathing and smiling, living our truth, living our path, finding our joy. That's what it takes for the world to change. And new earth is coming. Nothing can stop what's coming. Nothing can stop this light coming into the planet, the pressure that we feel to wake up, to get, you know, it's that like what you said about your son being depressed, you know, because he was doing something that was so out of alignment with his soul. It was in conformity to what society taught him he should do, which is make good money with all of his brilliance. But now he's going to do what I always say is when we're living our true path, 
It's the only thing we're not overqualified for. We're overqualified for everything else. So we do, I've done all these little jobs throughout my life, you know, every one of them I was overqualified for. But what I'm doing right now stretches me. It stretches me to the limit. I have to go into myself. I have to say, am I willing to do this today? Am I willing to talk to people out in the world? Am I willing to keep writing my books and putting them out there? Am I willing to keep putting out you know, member content, calling people to the table, saying, come on, let's grow together. Let's build a future for humanity. Let's build, and the children are leading us. It's so beautiful. My pleasure, Kitta. Thank you, and um, we shall see you soon. Um, JC, any other comments for me on signing off? JC is our our um, our production guy. We love him, and um, those of you who know me from Plasma Technology will know JC. So he's the one who's behind the scenes helping make all this happen. I couldn't do it by myself, and I'm really thankful for the people that are here being um, moderators for us. And I want to invite you all to you can join the Twitch channel. Um, you can make set up your own account at Twitch which gives you the ability you could become a moderator um, will be able to, you'll be able to subscribe and get special little things um, after we've been on here a few weeks and meanwhile you can just come and visit us um, 12 to 2 eastern time monday wednesday and friday and saturday evening six to eight and you can follow us and you can comment in the chat and actually have a conversation with us so we're really here because we're doing this live these are things i want to produce anyway but we would like to have you here talking to us and it helps make the conversation more interesting and fun. It helps us all grow together. And um, yeah, so that's why we're here. So I wanted to say, I love you all. Remember to breathe, smile and love and live your true path, live your dreams, live your vision, become who you truly are. Don't miss it because one time round on this merry-go-round and you can play the game and play the game and play the game and suddenly it's time to wake up and be who you really are and don't miss that part of the journey because that is the best part that's what i got to say all right we'll see you all soon and i'm going to go ahead jc and sign off and love you all. I am a 21st century superhuman. I know that the answers are inside. Yeah, I am a 21st century superhuman. Now, now, now is the time.